We will put our hearts, O Lord, to that alive and living presence that is the presence of the risen Jesus Christ in our midst. By the power of the Holy Spirit, mediate to us, O Lord, your power, your love, and your grace, that we might be freed, brought together under your most gracious rule, and directed by you in all that we do. Open our hearts, O Lord, to you, and we say, Speak, Lord. Your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome. I'm really glad to see you this morning. I'm glad very, very much that you are here. Some of you know a lot of people. Some of you are first-time visitors. Some of you haven't been here for a while, and I'm glad that you're all here regardless. You see, we're a very eclectic crowd here, and I, you need to know that I like that. Uh, if you look at the disciples of Jesus, they were a pretty eclectic crowd too. Uh, no matter who they are, Jesus had a wonderful way of bringing them in. And that's certainly my hope, that today, regardless of where you are or why you came, you would, in fact, be drawn to this resurrected Jesus that we talk about with such, such joy. So I have to ask you, why are you here? Is this an act of nostalgia? You know, you come every Easter, so it's about time to do it again. Is it because you're doing a favor for someone who hoped you would come to church at least today on Easter and you finally came just to keep them from nagging at you after you got home? Is this a way of affirming faith for you? Is that why you came? Or is coming here in fact an act of desperation? In the midst of one's darkness, a cry for help? Are you acting on a longing, hoping in fact a kind of shot in the dark that perhaps the tragedy that you know, the crisis in which you find yourself is not the bitter end? I. I have good news for you. Did you hear the line in the Acts reading where it says, what did Jesus do? He went about doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil. Are you under that kind of deadly weight where all you can do is look down and all you know in your heart is cynicism, fear? The resurrection power of Jesus can break that yoke. There is, in fact, a way out. In fact, I am very, very happy to tell you that it's not just that we're a group of eclectic cynics or people who are trying to figure it out, although some of us are like that, and you're welcome to be here. There are also those who come here today with actually great joy. They are rejoicing. Why? Because they've been found. They know it. They know deeply within their hearts, right here, the presence of the risen for Jesus. And so that for them, the gospel story isn't just a story. It's actually personally and deeply true. You see, they're like Mary Magdalene in the gospel, who goes in the gospel of John from starting out as in fact a deg degraded sinner to in fact an apostle, a body abused, a heart broken, transformed, in hearing Jesus call her name, there is no one who can say your name in the way that Jesus can. Filled with intimate knowing. When, when something happens in the presence of God, actually begins to break into your life, you know that at that point all the games are over. No pretense. All of the efforts that you've tried to make to sort of look good in God's presence, hoping maybe he'll like you today, you, you realize it's just a sham, that you're just playing games with yourself. God's not impressed. In fact, I think he probably thinks it's kind of funny. I mean, like when you have one of your children who come up and they're all dressed up and they're looking really terrific, and, and yet it's all you can do is laugh a little inside because they're so impressed with themselves. Even though you say out loud, Wow, you look wonderful. And you sort of hide a chuckle. 
Many of us are just like that when we come to the presence of God. We put on the right kind of clothes, we show up in church, and we know how to look solemn or do the thing that is asked of us, hoping that maybe perhaps it'll rub off in some way or another. Do you think God actually cares about any of that? I think what is far more important to God, the one before whom all hearts are open, all desires known, is that we put forth in front of him all that is in us. There are some here who are actually like Peter, flabbergasted by the evidence. Yes, I actually really do believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but I sure don't know what to do with it. Faith for people like that is actually confusing and, and kind of disturbing because they know it's probably more than what they know, but even the thought scares them a little bit. People like that are here and they're asking a lot of questions. There's some here like John. They love him. They've known Jesus, in fact, most of their lives. And they see the empty tomb in their mind's eye as they hear the story and they believe. They love him, but they don't know what to do either. They're just, in fact, normal people. Like John, they believe, but they also believe they can go back home to a normal life. The implications of what has happened actually hasn't registered yet. Not entirely. And there's still the people who are somehow trying to get Jesus to help them to be better at what they do. When in fact, actually what Jesus wants to do is not make them unfaithful to their obligations, but give them an entirely new life. Like Mary Magdalene, it will take a personal encounter with the risen Jesus direct, to do, redirect Peter, John, and many of us to being his followers as opposed to his admirers. So today, Mary Magdalene is in fact our messenger and our model. The least qualified becomes, as is famously said, an apostle to the apostles. And through this story, you see, an apostle to us. So, what do you do with this story? How do you think about it? Do you sort of go through this and then go back home and have dinner with your family? William Temple writes of this story, it is most manifestly the record of a genuine personal memory. Nothing else can account for the little details. So vivid, so little like the kind of thing that comes from an invention or imagination. In other words, we're dealing with something here that is in fact meant to personally challenge us. Do you remember, it's been quoted in a lot of sermons, John Updike's poem, Seven Stanzas of Easter? If you don't know it, you ought to go look it up. Updike draws a line in the sand where he basically says in that poem, no metaphor, real resurrection. Quote, make no mistake, if he rose at all, it was in fact his body. In other words, we're dealing with recollected history this morning, not myths. And if history, then as Christians have attested ever since the resurrection, Jesus is still alive and is calling people not just to be his admirers, but actually to come and to be his followers. But I warn you, if you say yes to Jesus and a willingness to be his follower, it will cost you. You can't sort of do it from an armchair. C.S. Lewis famously put it this way, our temptation is to look eagerly for the minimum that will be accepted. This is not that place. And Jesus is not that kind of savior. As Brennan Manning says, it takes courage to say yes to the present risenness of Jesus. Not history, but actually right here, in front of us, as we gather together in his name. Can you sense that? There is even in this building this morning a palpable sense of God inviting us to him and to open our hearts to him in new ways. This is not meant to be passive, as if somehow everything up here is the TV screen and you all are at home in your armchair with a beer watching. It's not like that at all. It's not even a kind of therapeutic invitation to somehow enter into the liturgies and the rituals, receive communion, and, and as a result, feel a little bit better about yourself. 
If that's really what you want, this is not the place to come. I mean, alcohol can do that. You don't need to come here. No, in fact, what we're talking about is literally a redirected life. Much more than somehow me being a better me. <laughs> but instead, in fact, being changed. Because Jesus is in fact committed to changing everything so that we are entirely and without reservation. His disciples, his followers, we can't fit him in, you see, into the regular life. That's a part of what Jesus says in the parable about putting new wine into old wine skins. It never works. The skin bursts. Try to fit Jesus into your iPhone daytimer. He will not be content to stay there. It's bigger. It's much, much bigger. Leslie Newbigin, the famous theologian, who in fact was an, a Christian evangelist among Hindus in India, said it has never been at any time possible to fit the resurrection of Jesus into any worldview except the one on which the resurrection is the basis. In other words, we're invited to come into something that is in fact entirely new. And to say yes to Christ means not just sort of laying down pieces of us, like the parts that we don't like, although it is that for sure. It is in fact, do you remember some of you old Episcopalians, the old service? And here we offer and present unto thee, O Lord, our selves, our souls and bodies to be a reasonable, holy and living sacrifice unto thee. In other words, what this is about, if Jesus is in fact resurrected from the dead, then that asks everything of us if we are to be his followers. You might want to consider, but then walk away. And listen, I would much rather you walk away, I really would, than sort of, you know, I'll try it. Jesus never did that, ever. In fact, Jesus did exactly the opposite. When people came to him, he would almost intentionally up the ante. Are you really in? Are you willing to be in? Are you willing to trust me for everything? And what drives us to take that kind of actually outlandish step? Because it is. I mean, we filled the cathedral this morning, but there are plenty of people on the planet, including maybe your neighbors, certainly people I know, who think what we believe here is really quite foolish, if not outright dangerous. We're deluded. We, in fact, could be a cog in the wheel of human progress. I have heard that. So to make the willing commitment to say, I will be his follower, regardless of what Jesus asks of me, regardless of what the cost is, regardless of what he will tell me to do, regardless of what he has to say about things, about career, about how I spend my time, is an extraordinary thing to ask of anyone. It's, it's daring just for me to say that. But I want you to know that if you're willing to continue to say yes, to keep crossing those thresholds, because you see, that's what it's like. What Jesus does is that he takes us by the shoulder and sort of begins to lead us and guide us, and then there's a fork in the road. And he says, okay, will you go here or will you go here? And if we say, God, I want to go where you're going, then certainly he will direct us. But then we come to another fork in the road. And he says, will you go here or will you go here? And if we say at that point, God, I'm willing to keep going, then we go the way he directs us. And on and on it is. We can, in fact, say no. He has given us that dignity to say yes or to say no. He respects us as humans, even though he knows whereof we are made. But if we are willing to say yes, what begins to happen is that he begins to work down into the deepest parts of our hearts, to work in us things that we could never even imagine. I want to read you a portion of a poem by Malcolm Geedy called, He Comes to Harrow Hell. He is a contemporary British poet. He says this, Begin the song exactly where you are, for where you are contains where you have been. But do not fear the memory of sin. 
This is a light that heals. And where it falls, transfigures and redeems the darkest stains into translucent colors. Loose the veils and draw the curtains back. Unbar the doors of that dread threshold where your spirit fails. The hopeless gate that holds in all the fears that haunt your shadowed city. Fling it wide and open to the light that finds and fares through the dark pathways where you run and hide, through all the alleys of your whittled heart, as pierced and open as his wounded side. Open the map of your life to him. Make a start. Down the dizzy spirals through the dark night, his light will go before you. Let him chart his light. Let him name and heal. Expose the hidden ache to him, the stinging fires and smoke that blind your judgment. Carry you away, the murk, the muted gloom in which you cannot find the love that you once thought worth dying for. Call him to all you cannot call to mind. He comes to harrow hell, and now to your well-guarded fortress. Let his love descend. As he begins to work that in you, a world, a new world, begins to open up. Purpose begins to happen in your life. If you read, heard the Isaiah reading at the beginning of the service, that's a vision of literally a new heaven and a new earth. I am. A, what is God doing? He is creating a new heaven and a new earth. And the changes that he begins to work in us even now are literally the foretaste and the down payment. The invitation to become a follower of Jesus is not just to have your heart changed. It's literally to be set on a new course where you are part of something that literally will change the world. Are you up for that? Are you up for being a part of something that is in fact putting you in the vanguard of God's army in such a way is that the world begins to be changed. Not through military might. Not through political maneuvering. Not, for bus not through some kind of savvy bus business deal. But literally by the deeds that God uses you to give lives around you begin to be readjusted in a new kind of way. It is, in fact, God's call on your life, if you are a Christian, to be a part of his transforming work. That's what I'm up for. If I were called to be a bishop and the job of a bishop was to be a middle manager just to make sure the machinery works, I'd say, you've got the wrong guy. And if your idea of being a Christian is to function in that kind of middle management system where you just sort of go about your business, you've got the wrong gospel. God is calling you and me through his resurrection power to both be changed and to be an agent of change in a way that sets our hearts on fire, in a way that actually makes a tangible difference in the world, in a way that places us in the flow of his history that will finally culminate in his return, where we see the very new heaven and new earth that he has been working on all along. Are you up for that? That's what we're here to celebrate. That's the resurrection of Jesus, changing us and using us for a world that he desires and in fact is changing. So today's service is, in fact, an invitation. An invitation not just to let go of the sins you know, but also to let go of boredom, cynicism, and a humdrum life. And a willingness to say to him, Okay, God, I feel entirely unprepared, but if you're calling me, I'm going to come. I, am, I will do this. And see what it is that he will do both in you and through you. Remember, I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly to the full. That's this kind of life. Sure, you can go through the motions and then go home and have ham and lamb and all of that. Hide Easter eggs. It's all fun. But this is bigger and much more important. 
It's a redirected life. It's giving Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, unreserved permission to do whatever he desires. <laughs> Come and be a part of the adventure. Amen.